nation of Americans. And then there was a sense that there was, as John Kennedy said, vigor. We can do things. The world came knocking and he uh, uh, became the president of the United States. He fed off the crowd. He loved to go into a crowd and shake hands. He wanted the people to feel that he was just one of them. And therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the words, Ich bin ein Berliner. If there was one thing, one thing about foreign policy that Kennedy was determined to do during his administration, it was to avoid a nuclear conflict. He had finally done what Robert Frost, the poet, had urged him to do in his poem at the inaugural, which is um, to marry poetry to power. He inspired people to be part of something that was larger than they were. John Kennedy was elected president in 1960 in one of the closest elections in U.S. history. Kennedy faced enormous challenges while in office, a tense Cold War rivalry with the Soviet Union, and growing demands for civil rights at home. Kennedy's time in the White House was brief, a mere thousand days. But 50 years after his death, Kennedy's unique style and grace endure, and his legacy continues to be a source of both inspiration and debate. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. For those old enough to remember, it's a moment they'll never forget. Within minutes, news of the president's death flashed across the country and around the world. America was in a state of shock. And among those hardest hit were members of the president's own Secret Service detail, especially those closest to him on that fateful day in Dallas. We got to Dallas. Uh, the airport was filled with people uh, exuberant about the president, and Mrs. Kennedy, arriving there. We had had a wonderful reception the day before uh, for President and Mrs. Kennedy throughout Texas. We had no advanced intelligence information that would indicate we were going to have a serious problem. He fed off the crowd. He loved to go into a crowd and shake hands. And so he didn't like the bubble top on the car. Near the end of the motorcade route, the president's limousine made a fateful turn onto Elm Street in front of the Texas School Book Depository Building. I heard an explosive noise over my right shoulder from the rear. I wasn't sure that it was a rifle shot or a firecracker or what it was. I saw the president grab at his throat and he moved violently to his left because he had a back brace on and he couldn't move forward. So he moved left and he started to slump and his head kind of went tilted down. Just as I approached the car, there was a third shot and that hit the president in the head. And his head was tilted down and to the left so that the shot entered the rear of the head here and exploded and blew out the right rear portion of the head. I was just starting to get up on the car. Mrs. Kennedy then came up on the trunk of the car. She was trying to grab some of the material that came off the president's head from the uh, explosive wound. I thought it must have been a fatal wound, but I didn't know for sure. The only thing Mrs. Kennedy said was, oh, Jack, oh, Jack, what have they done? And then she said, Jack, I love you. Within minutes, the motorcade arrived at Parkland Hospital. Mrs. Kennedy had a hold of him, and she wouldn't let go. I pleaded with her to please allow us to help the president. Uh, she continued to hold on to him. And I realized that the problem was she didn't want anybody to see the condition he was in, because it was terrible. So I took off my suit coat, and I covered up his head and his upper back, and when I did that, she let go. We lifted the president up, put him on a gurney, and rushed him into the emergency room. A short time later, President Kennedy was pronounced dead, sending shockwaves around the world. Reporters covering the story tried to meet an insatiable demand for the latest information. 
I'm sitting there at the desk, the phone rings, I answer it, and the woman says, is there anybody there who can give me a ride to Dallas? And I said, lady, uh, we're not running a taxi here, and besides, the president's been shot. And she said, yes, I heard on the radio, I think my son is the one they've arrested, and it was Lee Harvey Oswald's mother. I got in the back seat with her, the other reporter, Bill Foster, drove, and uh, we drove her to Dallas. What struck me about the interview was uh, she immediately began talking about herself. And mind you, the president had been dead only a few hours and she was talking about how it would affect her. Uh, I later concluded that she, she was just simply deranged. Oswald was being held at the Dallas police station. And from time to time, he was walked along a hallway lined with reporters and cameramen. Nothing like this had ever happened before, and uh, everybody was just, you know, just operating, uh, you know, uh, one thing at a time. And uh, it was total bedlam, uh, a lot of pushing and shoving, uh, a lot of back and forth, uh, a lot of things that I, you know, still, still don't understand today. At Love Field, Vice President Lyndon Johnson was waiting to be sworn in. And she stood by the, the uh, new president as he was sworn in, in her blood-soaked suit. And I hadn't changed anything. And uh, that's the photograph that went out worldwide of she standing beside President Johnson as he was sworn in. Two days after the assassination, President Kennedy's casket lay in state in the East Room of the White House. And the Kennedy family had one more request for Clint Hill. Mrs. Kennedy and Robert Kennedy were on the main floor of the White House and they wanted to observe uh, the president. They wanted to have the casket open. Then walked up to the casket and spent some time there uh, in the presence of the president. During that process, she finally turned to me and she said, Mr. Hill, will you get me a pair of scissors? I said, yes, ma'am. And I ran down to the usher's office and got a pair of scissors and brought them back, gave them to her. And I stood there as I could hear the clip clip of the scissors. I knew that she was cutting some strands from his hair as a memento. She then handed the scissors to me, and she and Robert Kennedy turned and walked out of the East Room. On that same morning in Dallas, nightclub owner Jack Ruby shot Lee Harvey Oswald in the basement of the Dallas police station. He's been shot. He's been shot. Lee Oswald. Well, uh, you couldn't believe it. I mean, I didn't believe it when I heard about it, you know? I mean, we, we, we said, what? I mean, how can that be? But it was. And, you know, uh, and the way that Ruby got down there, people say, how in the world could he be there? Well, again, it was a very different time. In those days, which is why I always wore a snap rim hat, so I would look like a detective. If you look like you belong somewhere, generally speaking, uh, you could get in. The intensive coverage of the Kennedy assassination also signaled a major shift in the news business. Up until that point, uh, most people in America got their news from print, uh, from newspapers. And uh, from that weekend on, of course, uh, it would be television. Fifty years after the assassination, the memories of those who were there remain vivid doesn't seem like 50 years have gone by and I don't I just feel like it's very current and I feel uh, some sadness because of what happened uh, I still have that slight sense of guilt and responsibility failure up until that point we'd always thought of our presidents as being larger than life almost invincible and here this glamorous vigorous young man cut down in the prime of his life by, by a madman. I think it, it caused all of us to, if nothing else, to understand the, the preciousness of life. It was the weekend that America lost its innocence, and the country has never been the same since that weekend in Dallas. John Kennedy brought youth and energy to the White House when he became president in 1961. He and First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy also brought something else, their own unique sense of style and glamour, the likes of which Washington had never seen before. It became known as the Age of Camelot, a reference to the hit Broadway musical at the time, 
one of President Kennedy's favorites. President Kennedy and the First Lady venture from the White House. January 1961, the new president and his First Lady emerge from the White House. And a new era begins in Washington, known as the Age of Camelot. Under the leadership of President John F. Kennedy. She was always extremely well-dressed. Uh, the women loved to, loved to see her. Uh, and that there was this mystery about her, too, that she was someone who didn't come out of the White House much, who didn't give a lot of interviews, who wasn't seen in a lot of photographs, really. The public's fascination with Jackie Kennedy began during the presidential campaign. I think politics is one of the most rewarding lives a woman can have, to be married to a politician. I think every woman wants to feel needed, and in politics you are. But at times, she found public life a struggle. She was somewhat secretive. She was elusive. She was like Kennedy. So she withheld herself from the public to a certain degree. And that's what made her so, I think, so appealing. The ride to the Hotel de Ville was one of the highlights of President Kennedy's three-day stay in Paris. With Mrs. Kennedy, who proved immensely popular with all Parisians, that appeal extended well beyond the United States. Jackie Kennedy became an international celebrity after she traveled with the president to Europe. While her husband confirmed... I am the man who accompanied Jacqueline Kennedy to Paris, and I've enjoyed it. And she did charm de Gaulle. Uh, she was an expert in uh, French history. And de Gaulle, afterwards, uh, de Gaulle said to JFK, you know, your wife knows more French history than most fr French people do. Jackie Kennedy's star power was also on display during visits to India and Pakistan. She relished the role as her husband's unofficial ambassador at large. Back at home, the Kennedys projected an aura of the all-American family. Uh, there's a wonderful picture of when uh, uh, JFK comes back from his triumphant trip to Berlin and uh, Ireland, and he gets off of the helicopter in uh, Hyannisport, and she rushes up, and they throw their arms around each other and give this incredible hug. It was the first kind of picture like that in three years. But in private, the truth was often more complicated. For many years, she had to pretend that her marriage was perfect, and uh, which, of course, it wasn't. And she knew, uh, even when she got married, she knew that her husband had a, a reputation as a womanizer. To escape the pressures of Washington, the first couple often invited close friends to relax out on the water near the president's Hyannisport home on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. For him, I think it was growing up in Hyannisport, growing up by the sea. I mean, the house is right by the sea. He learned to sail as a little boy. And then, of course, uh, he became a war hero uh, in the Navy, in the sea. He was a great swimmer. Um, and so I think, that, I think that explains it. Jackie Kennedy was more at home on horseback, an experience she was eager to share with her children. She loved it. She had uh, ridden as a girl. She had ridden throughout her life. She wanted Caroline and John to ride. It was very important to her. It was Jackie Kennedy who, a week after her husband's assassination, compared their time in the White House to Camelot. Jackie was already thinking about his place in history and his judgment by what Kennedy called the high court of history. That once there was a fleeting wisp of glory called Camelot. Many historians see John Kennedy's Camelot legacy as a complementary mix of style and substance. In his final months, he had finally done what Robert Frost, the poet, had urged him to do in his poem at the inaugural, which is um, to marry poetry to power. The world was a vastly different place when John Kennedy became president in 1961. The United States and the Soviet Union were engaged in a Cold War, 
where the front lines were Berlin, Cuba, and Vietnam. Kennedy came into office determined to counter communism, but an early foreign policy failure in Cuba got his administration off to a rocky start. We shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. The administration suffered an early misstep by backing a CIA plan for the invasion of Cuba by anti-Castro exiles at the Bay of Pigs. The ill-conceived invasion was a debacle, and Kennedy learned a valuable lesson. It's an utter failure. So much so that Kennedy afterwards said repeatedly, how could I have been so stupid? And he's mortified, deeply pained by this. And it creates tremendous distrust for him in the military. That early setback in Cuba, combined with Kennedy's youth and inexperience, meant he had to earn respect from world leaders, including both allies and rivals, during an early trip to Europe. And so the very fact that Kennedy would be seen standing next to de Gaulle, being treated as an equal, you see, is an enormous boost to Kennedy's international standing. But then he goes off to Vienna to meet with Nikita Khrushchev, Soviet first secretary, and Khrushchev beats up on him unmercifully as this young man who doesn't know what he's doing. And the issue is Berlin. Kennedy worried that the tense standoff over the divided city of Berlin could lead to the unthinkable. Kennedy comes away from that meeting with such a sense of despair that maybe we're going to face a nuclear war. If there was one thing, one thing about foreign policy that Kennedy was determined to do during his administration, it was to avoid a nuclear conflict. President Kennedy faced his greatest foreign policy test in October of 1962, when U.S. spy planes discovered Soviet military activity on the island nation of Cuba. A series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. We will not prematurely or unnecessarily risk the course of worldwide nuclear war in which even the fruits of victory would be ashes in our mouth. Kennedy ordered a naval blockade of Cuba to stop the delivery of Soviet missiles. The 13-day Cuban Missile Crisis brought the world to the brink of nuclear war. He wanted to try diplomacy first, which he did, used the uh, blockade, which he shrewdly called a quarantine, and won that struggle with Khrushchev. The missile crisis convinced Kennedy to find ways to defuse Cold War tensions. A few months before he died came one of his greatest achievements, the signing of a limited nuclear test ban treaty with the Soviet Union that set the stage for future arms agreements with Moscow. There's no question, I think, that he grew in office. He wasn't going to surrender. He wasn't going to give up the United States. But diplomacy, do everything in your power to rein this in. Now, I think if he lived, if he lived, I think we might have seen a detente policy before Richard Nixon came to it several years later. Angels of mercy to wounded soldiers in the Vietnam War are the helicopters. Flying ambulance. In his final months in office, Kennedy also sent conflicting signals about the wisdom of continued U.S. military involvement in South Vietnam. I don't think he ever would have put in the massive numbers of troops that Johnson committed. Would he have gotten out? I don't know. But I, I just don't think he would have escalated that war the way Johnson did. The Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union was at its peak in 1963, and there was no greater flashpoint than the divided city of Berlin. This section of the Berlin Wall once separated east from west communists from free. There are some who say that communism is the wave of the future. Let them come to Berlin.
President Kennedy came to Berlin in June of 1963. The divided city had become the front line in the Cold War. Berlin had highly symbolic value for both sides. This is where American values and American freedom should be defended against what then were the communist powers. In August of 1961, Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev ordered the Berlin Wall built to prevent East Germans from fleeing. Fear and chaos gripped the city. The Western Allies, especially the Americans, were there to protect us, but that was a, a kind of naive conviction. The Germans had criticized Kennedy for accepting the war. The president arrived in Berlin unsure how he would be received. His purpose was to reassure the Germans that the U.S. was their number one ally and that Soviet aggression would stop at the wall. People had been lining up uh, all over the city. School kids didn't have to go to school that day. Many major companies let their workers go. Seeing the crowds cheering in the streets and peering over the wall at the Brandenburg Gate, Kennedy was deeply moved. He decided the speech he planned to give later at City Hall was inadequate to capture the feeling of the moment. So he basically on the spot decided he's not going to give that speech and um, he had someone help him write down on a note card a few things in German and then delivered the famous speech that we all know. It was just absolute crazy. I mean, the place itself is not that large. So uh, in order to get those masses of people there, they had to stand in all the side streets. All the balconies were filled. Everybody wanted to be there. I am proud to come to this city. There's, I think, two key components. One is Kennedy is actually talking about that some people do suggest detente policy and working together with the Soviet Union. What is the great issue between the free world and the communist world? Let them come to Berlin. He says, let them come to Berlin. And they will see, you cannot work with them. Look at the wall, look at this terrible symbol of, of what, what the Eastern countries, what the Soviet Union stands for, what communism stands for. In the world of freedom, the proudest boast is, Ich bin ein Berliner. And the other message was to renew once again America's commitment to Berlin and he did this with the most famous words of that speech, Ich bin ein Berliner. There were some doubts whether he would be able to stand up to Khrushchev or whether Khrushchev would uh, take him as a young, inexperienced president. All that was gone. In East Berlin, reaction was more critical. The reaction was, we do not belong to this world and will never belong to this world because the Americans will have the West Berliners, but not us. The applause seemed endless. Though the wall would stand for another 26 years, at that moment, Kennedy stood firm against the Soviets. He later told an aide, we will never have a day like this one as long as we live. John Kennedy's life and presidency were both cut short on November 22nd, 1963. Many historians say Kennedy had only modest achievements while in office, but public opinion polls show Kennedy remains popular and that Americans continue to be inspired by the ideals and hope that his legacy represents 50 years after his death. Space exploration was an important part of John Kennedy's new frontier. The president with Vice President Johnson watched the first manned launch to be viewed around... The early success of the Mercury manned space missions under Kennedy set the stage for the moon landing later in the decade and remains one of his signature achievements. 
was not about what I can do for you. It was, I'm, you should do this because it's tough, because it's difficult. We're going to go to the moon because it is hard and it will take all our best energies, but that will make us a better people when we do that. President Kennedy's call to service during the inaugural address set the stage for one of his lasting achievements, the creation of the Peace Corps. Putting that together was one of the great experiences of my own uh, life. Um, and Kennedy wanted action, he wanted us to move, and we had the plan of the Peace Corps within the first six weeks. There are a lot of other service programs that have come after that, but nothing captures the imagination in the same way as the Peace Corps. It's really trusting our young people that they can be great ambassadors around the world. One of the most vexing issues John Kennedy faced while in office was civil rights. A few months before he died, Kennedy made a fresh appeal for action to Congress. We are confronted primarily with a moral issue. It is as old as the scriptures and is as clear as the American Constitution. The heart of the question is whether all Americans are to be afforded equal rights and equal opportunities. We don't know we what greatness he could America. have come to. Uh, we lost somebody who was on, on the way toward greatness, in my opinion, at a time we needed that. Many still wonder how the world might be different if John Kennedy had lived. It's really sad. Our country lost a lot in November 1963 and when my father was killed. It was a lot and I think we would have been a much better country had they lived. I'm not a believer that, you know, that tra out of tragedy good, good can come. I think a lot of pain came and a, and a lot of bad things for our country. You know, after President Kennedy went to Berlin, he went to Ireland. And he said that that was the happiest four days of his life. And when he, would, he was killed, um, uh, he had a rosary in his pocket. And Jackie sent that rosary to the people of Ireland, to the town that his grandfather came from, because she knew how much he believed his values came from that Irish immigrant experience. the faith, the devotion, which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. Mr. President, your brother Ted recently on television said that after seeing the cares of office on you, that he wasn't sure he'd ever be interested in being the president. I wonder if you could tell us whether, if you had it to do over again, you would uh, work for the presidency and whether you can recommend the job to others. Uh, well, the answer is, uh, the first is yes, and the second is no. I don't recommend it to others. <laughs> At least for a while. Yeah. <laughs> I guess we, uh, this uh, chimpanzee who was flying in space uh, took off at 10.08. He reports that everything is perfect and working well. <laughs> the Republican National Committee recently uh, adopted a resolution saying you were pretty much of a failure. <laughs> I'm sure it was passed uh, unanimously. Uh. <laughs>